Inside the Magic Show number 477 for May 25th, 2014. It is Sunday, May 25th, 2014. This is show 477 of Inside the Magic. And as always, I am your host, Ricky Briganti, with another fun show packed with Disney and theme park news. A lot of really uh, interesting things happening this week. Uh, Before I get to all of it, I invite you to visit our website at InsideTheMagic.net. There you'll find all of our podcasts, videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And if you ever have any news, tips, questions, comments, or anything else, you can always email me at Ricky at InsideTheMagic.net or you can call and leave a message at 407-494-4ITM. That's 4486. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of Inside the Magic is once again brought to you by Magical Travel Free Dining is back for travel to Walt Disney World between August 31st and almost the end of the year, December 23rd. Most dates are included. Certain restrictions do apply, but you're going to want to book now for the best availability by calling Magical Travel today at 866-207-8387 or visit them online at MagicalTravel.com to receive a free price quote and be sure to mention inside the magic when you do that to receive your free disney gift card for qualifying bookings when you book your disney vacation with magical travel and thanks very much to mark shackleford for your donation this week and to all contributors to the show i thank each and every one of you and now let's get started with a trip around the world So it was a rather exhausting weekend uh, for many a Disney fan, uh, both out here in Florida and California, because both Walt Disney World and Disneyland held yet another 24-hour day. This time it's it was the Rock Your Disney Side Party, began 6 a.m. on Friday morning and continued all the way through to 6 a.m. on Saturday at the Magic Kingdom out here, as well as both Disneyland and Disney California Adventure in California, naturally. Uh, out here, uh, it all began with a very similar sort of opening moment as uh, the past two versions of these 24-hour days, uh, sort of the, the standard opening for the day out there in front of the train station or on the train station uh, of the Magic Kingdom, except they added in uh, sort of the theme this year was to feature heroes and villains. So in attendance for the opening ceremony were Aurora, Maleficent, Peter Pan, Captain Hook, Snow White, the Evil Queen, Mickey, and Minnie Mouse. Uh, some fireworks went off. Uh, very briefly, just a quick blast, and uh, and there it was the beginning of 24 hours uh, at the Magic Kingdom. You can see video of everything I just described over on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, three hours after that, at 6 a.m. California time, uh, their opening moment uh, actually had a little bit of a, a celebrity-infused uh, entertainment because Frozen star Josh Gad was there, a surprise out in the Esplanade, standing next to an 18,000-pound sand sculpture of Olaf, naturally. Uh, Of course, Gad voiced Olaf for Frozen. Uh, He helped to kick off the event at Disneyland. So uh, that was, uh, you know, fireworks and all that were, happened out there. Um, and you can check out some, some photos and video of that as well on our website. Uh, proceeding throughout the 24 hours, uh, Walt Disney World had a, a webcam set up for those who couldn't be there uh, up on the uh, train station pointing into Town Square and down Main Street. And Disneyland actually had four webcams set up throughout uh, both of the parks. So there was it was five simultaneous views, live views for 24 hours, which was pretty neat. Unfortunately, they've shut them down now. So uh, I don't expect to be able to see them, but uh, it was neat while it lasted. Of course, this 24-hour day concept first started back on February 29th, 2012, uh, because it was leap year, leap day, and that was the one more Disney day, and then last year was a monstrous summer. Now this year, rock your Disney side, and people definitely rocked their Disney side. Uh, that is uh, Disney bounding and you know coming in costume, and a lot of uh, guests showed up in uh, various character-inspired attire throughout uh, the party, which was pretty fun to see, but 
things got really exciting at night at the Magic Kingdom as the Disney villains took over. There was a new character cavalcade that uh, rolled through just ahead of the Main Street Electrical Parade, a pre-parade. Uh, Disney called it It's Good to Be Bad, which uh, if you know the Boo to You Halloween Parade during Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party, that phrase should sound familiar. They played a remix of the It's Good to Be Bad music that uh, happens during that, and there were a lot of uh, villain characters that were part of this cavalcade, including a few surprises. Oogie Boogie was there, which uh, the last time we saw him was on Friday the 13th, uh, many months ago, and uh, it was last year, and that was uh, kind of the craziness over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, where people waited hours and hours and hours to meet Oogie Boogie. Uh, Well, he was back. Unfortunately, he wasn't meeting and greeting at the Magic Kingdom. He was just in this uh, pre-parade, but along with him were uh, uh, Megara and Hades, uh, Pain and Panic, Dr. Facilier, Captain Hook, Evil Queen, Maleficent, Queen of Hearts, Bowler Hat Guy, Cruella de Vil, uh, Cinderella's evil stepsisters, Big Bad Wolf, Frollo, Sheriff of Nottingham, Jafar, and Stromboli from uh, Pinocchio. That was uh, definitely one of those uh, very rare characters that was out, and he was meeting and greeting with people. But uh, I want to play a little uh, sample uh, here of the music that was uh, played during that pre-parade. Again, this will sound sort of familiar, but it's definitely a a remixed, uh, kind of like auto-tuned version of the It's Good to Be Bad song. So here's what it sounded like as it uh, rolled through the Magic Kingdom for the first time. As they revel in just how good it is to be bad. (laughs) A little repetitive there, but uh, there you go. That's what it sounded like as the pre-parade uh, rolled through. And, uh, of course, you can see uh, lots of video and photos of that uh, event over on our website and YouTube channel as well. Now, many of those characters stayed out uh, following the... Uh, it was two performances of the Main Street Electrical Parade, and then after the second one, a lot of those characters replaced their uh, corresponding heroes in the park, uh, like Dr. Fazilier replaced Tiana and her meet-and-greet, and, greet and uh, you know... Uh, etc. So uh, they, they all kind of swapped out uh, a Maleficent instead of Aurora and so on. Uh, so uh, the ones that attracted the most attention were definitely Megara and Hades. Uh, people had lined up for hours in advance of uh, their appearance and then they finally came out after 2 a.m. and the line was long enough to last all the way until the very end of this 24-hour day. Uh, so a lot of excitement there as well as in uh, Princess Fairy Tale Hall. They uh, took over half of it and calling it a uh, Scary Tale Hall and put a couple of villains in there and that at, uh, when it first opened had a posted wait time of 300 minutes uh, which I don't think it was actually that long but that's just where it began and they maybe whittled it down from there Uh, but the biggest surprise of the evening was something that not all guests got to experience. Uh, Tucked away deep inside Cinderella Castle was a very special meet and greet uh, for uh, some guests received tickets to uh, attend this I'm not even honestly sure how they got the tickets uh, out here in Florida to it it was some sort of surprise giveaway of some sort in the park Uh, and uh, inside Cinderella Castle was Maleficent but not 
classic Maleficent. This was new live action Angelina Jolie movie Maleficent. Now, Angelina Jolie was not actually there. That would have been crazy, but uh, it was somebody who uh, very much resembled her. A really excellent Angelina Jolie uh, lookalike portraying that character and doing a spot on job with it. Her facial expressions and her mannerisms and her uh, just everything about her, her presence really embodied that character and they did a fantastic job with it and uh, I had a chance to talk to her just a little bit. She was very soft spoken but I I think that was on purpose to retain her you know uh, subtly sinister side so here's my uh, my rather brief conversation with this live action movie version of Maleficent. Hello Maleficent how are you? How are you uh, enjoying the Magic Kingdom at three in the morning? Is it three? It is. Past your bedtime. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I hope you sleep very well tonight. Are you excited about everybody seeing your movie? <laughs> of course. And before she answered that question there at the end, she kind of looked off to the side and gave a very uh, a perfect sort of sinister grin that, that was straight out of the Maleficent uh, a trailer that everybody has seen. So uh, you, you definitely need to go watch the the video of that uh, on our YouTube channel as well because it's it, it's it's shocking how much this uh, this character looked like uh, Angelina Jolie as uh, as Maleficent, which I'm looking forward to seeing that movie uh, this week. Uh, hopefully it is hopefully it is very good. So. Um, that's kind of the recap of the 24-hour day. It was a lot of other, you know, sort of little things going on, dance parties and photo ops and that sort of thing. But really, it was just a chance for everybody to go to the park and have fun. I didn't make it quite all the way till 6 a.m., nor had I was there since 6 a.m. I kind of went much later in the day. And I ended up being in the park for about seven hours, I think. I, I left a little bit before 4 a.m., um, which was enough for me uh, so I could still you know actually get some sleep but uh, it was fun and I know a lot of people did stay for the full 24 hours and uh, it seems like it was very well attended pretty well organized everybody had a lot of fun uh, Seven Dwarves Mine Train had uh, essentially is in full soft opening now it, it opened for the full entirety of the 24 hours and remained open uh, the following day uh, this weekend and continues to be open so uh, even though the official opening isn't until uh, the 28th just a few days from now it's pretty much open at this point so uh, that's good news for Everybody seemed like everyone was really enjoying uh, riding that. I, I went and rode it one more time that night and had a blast. So uh, overall, this uh, this version of the 24-hour Disney day seemed to go over very well, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do it again in the future. Now here's some other uh, things that were going on at the Magic Kingdom this week. A few days prior, uh, Tinkerbell has moved away from her Adventureland uh, magical nook that she and her fairy friends had moved into three years ago. Tinkerbell is now meeting in uh, the the Town Square Theater with FastPass Plus and all of that, Uh, but her fairy friends are not. They are no longer uh, part of the meet and greet experience at the Magic Kingdom, so it's just Tinkerbell in uh, sort of a similar looking environment, but deep inside Town Square Theater instead, and the Magical Nook is now closed. Uh, also, uh, around Walt Disney World, not just the Magic Kingdom, there's this new uh, ice cream item that you can order called Mickey's Kitchen Sink Sundae. Now, you know about the Kitchen Sink, the massive ice cream sundae that uh, beaches and cream. Uh, well, this is sort of a, a somewhat smaller version of it in a plastic uh, kitchen sink of sorts that you can keep that's Mickey-themed. Well, when it first debuted a few weeks ago, it was like $25 out here at Walt Disney World. Meanwhile, at Disneyland, it was only like 12 or $13. So now uh, they've figured out a way to draw the price out here. I mean, there was different ingredients and different sizes of them, so it was bigger out here, but now they've found a sort of happy medium, and it's now $15 out here in Florida and $12 in California, because, again, it's still, you know, different ingredients, different uh, toppings, different uh, amounts of ice cream, etc., but um, you know, very close to being the same thing now. Here's a special event that is coming up in a couple of weeks on June 13th is the inaugural Fittipaldi Cup at the Walt Disney World Speedway in which uh, guests who pay for this experience can compete in a racing uh, competition with Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Porsches, muscle cars, and even go-karts. It costs $999 to participate, uh, but you get to do a whole lot of driving, and the ultimate winner of the entire uh, uh, competition gets to take home the first-ever Fittipaldi Cup trophy. 
Uh, so if, if you're a big, big uh, into driving, that might be an uh, excellent opportunity for you. If you're not that big into it, well, that's, that's a lot of money. Now, of course, we've been talking about My Magic Plus and FastPass Plus for a long time now. In fact, this week I even wrote a, an article about so, sort of where it all began, the development process of it, how it started, how it got to be where it is now, and a little bit looking toward the future. So if you want to read more in-depth about all of that with some interviews, uh, head over to InsideTheMagic.net and look for that article. But uh, that aside, the Orlando Sentinel just reported a couple of days ago that uh, Nick Franklin, who is the executive vice president for the Next Gen Project, which is basically... My Magic Plus for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. Uh, he oversaw the development of My Magic Plus. He is leaving Disney now that My Magic Plus has uh, kind of officially rolled out. Although they're still tweaking things, uh, he's I guess he's decided that his work there is done. He's been with the company for many many years. I think it was like 17 years. Uh, but in July he'll be leaving Disney uh, just on his own accord. And uh, yeah, he's been with Disney since uh, 1996. So uh, quite a while. But uh, now you know he's he's done his thing and I guess is ready to move on. So now let's jump over to Universal Orlando with a lot of uh, really exciting news this week with, of course, the biggest excitement going on over there and really anywhere in the world of theme parks right now is the uh, Wizarding World of Harry Potter expansion Diagon Alley over at Universal Studios Florida. And uh, quite a lot uh, came out this week about that, starting with uh, I received a, an itinerary for the big uh, unveiling press hoopla that's going to be going on uh, in the middle of next month and uh, found out a little bit of details as to what that's all going to uh, include. I, I had previously... Uh, uh, said that the the grand media event for this was going to be four days long. Well, it's really actually not. It's only really one and a half days of uh, Potter themed things. Then there's other uh, uh, items that are going on with the uh, the schedule. But for as far as Harry Potter goes, there's going to be one full media day, of course, because they want to show off all of Diagon Alley. And uh, other than that, there's going to be a nighttime red carpet event where the select uh, film stars will show up. They haven't said which ones will be there, but hopefully it'll be as grand as last time around with a lot of the biggest stars uh one thing absent from the itinerary is in a grand opening of some sort or a moment or a date or an anything universal still has not confirmed uh the official opening date of diagon alley everyone's kind of thinking well it's got to be right after this press event but that's not confirmed just yet um but they are including the full grand opening of the cabana bay beach resort during this event uh, in addition to all the potter stuff uh there since there's still the other half of cabana bay to open with a whole other wing of rooms and a, a lazy river and another pool and, and a whole lot more so so I'm uh, looking forward to seeing all of that as well. That's all taking place in the middle of June. Uh, but something else is also taking place in the middle of June that uh, was announced this week. That The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon is going to be taping here in Orlando just in time for that preview of Diagon Alley as well. In fact, the taping dates for uh, The Tonight Show are going to be uh, June 16th through 19th, which overlaps a little bit with the press event, which is the 17th, 18th the 19th. Uh, the list of uh, uh, celebrities and performers that will be part of the Tonight Show tapings at Universal Orlando will be Jennifer Lopez, Keenan Ivory Wayans, Kevin Hart, Jimmy Buffett, Tracy Morgan, the band Fun, and uh, Pitbull. <clears throat> Excuse me, Pitbull. And uh, so tickets were very, very briefly available uh, for free, but they disappeared uh, in, in a flash. So they are all gone at this point. However, The Tonight Show is hosting a contest to bring 22 winners to a v the uh, VIP preview of Diagon Alley and see the tapings as well. So you're going to want to check uh, their website to find out more about the uh, potential for winning a trip to uh, see all of that and I will be going to one of those tonight's show tapings so that should be fun uh, I, I've not uh, exactly been following uh, Jimmy Fallon's adventures because I'm, uh, I've am i been loyal to Conan O'Brien for basically since the beginning of his first show years and years and years ago I've been watching him regularly almost every night so uh, I, I followed him to the tonight show and then away from the tonight show so, but I, I do like Jimmy Fallon so I'm looking forward to seeing his show as well 
But there is more really, really big, uh, literally big Diagon Alley news that uh, just this weekend, the uh, kind of the crowning jewel of Diagon Alley has shown up by Crane. The massive, extremely detailed dragon uh, has been uh, uh, lifted and put on top of Gringotts Bank. Uh, it will eventually uh, have big wings and and breathe fire. The wings aren't there yet, and the fire certainly isn't either. But it's it's in progress. They are working on installing it now. But you can definitely see it already from the surrounding areas. They quickly uh, surrounded it by a lot of scaffolding and and tarps, so you couldn't see all of it. But you still see its its giant neck and head and and tail way up. And I mean, you walk around in the park for Mel's uh, a, a drive in uh, over to the Simpsons area and any to anywhere you have an eye shot of the London waterfront area in front of Diagon on alley you can see the dragon up overhead over the top of it so that's definitely going to be the the weenie of the area of uh, you know you see you're going to see the fireball and you're, it'll draw your attention over there as if your attention needs to be you know taken over to the harry potter expansion more than it already will be but uh it should be pretty exciting when all once all of that is complete um head over to the website uh, our website to uh, see some photos of uh the the dragon uh if you it's a little spoilery but i mean it's out there it's it's you can't miss it so uh you should you should see. It's, it's an incredible incredible sculpture uh, for this thing to be sitting up there it looks so very very realistic it's uh really really quite a sight Here's a little bit more Universal uh, Orlando news. Actually, before I get to that, I've got one more Potter-related uh, uh, story here. Universal Orlando has also announced a special Diagon Alley vacation package that will include early access to the Wizarding World. Uh, that's starting June 29th. So they are uh, basically saying that, yes, Diagon Alley will be open by June 29th. So somewhere in between the press event and June 29th, it's going to officially open. It seems likely that it'll be the 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Um, but uh, it'll it'll definitely be by the, uh, by the 20th. Now, in other Universal Orlando news, Halloween Horror Nights construction has begun already, and uh, a detail has come out as well regarding one of the live shows. Uh, they've, they've previously said, uh, several weeks ago, they said there will be eight haunted houses this year, uh, multiple street experiences, and two live shows. Well, now, a casting call went out to, uh, to hire performers for the return of the Rocky Horror Picture Show tribute. Uh, so that will be back once again, and likely the other live show will be Bill and Ted's Excellent Halloween Adventure. They haven't confirmed that yet, but it's, I mean, that's been going on for almost as long as Horror Nights has, so uh, it's highly likely that those will be the two shows this year. Uh, auditions are going to be taking place June 3rd and June, ele- uh, I'm sorry, June 8th for a Rocky Horror Picture Show tribute, so if you are interested in performing in that, uh, you'll want to check out the Universal Orlando uh, website or the, the casting section of that. Uh, also, one more uh, universal bit here over in City Walk. Uh, recently, uh, was talking about uh, Antajitos, the Mexican restaurant that has opened there. Really great restaurant. Well, now it is open for lunch service as well. There's no gap between lunch and dinner. It's open during the day and then just goes straight into dinner service at night. And the menu is actually almost identical between day and night, except they have this great uh, uh, sandwich that is now uh, available there that I had today as I was walking around Universal and taking a lot of photos and just kind of having fun. Um, lunch sandwich was really good. Uh, so uh, definitely worth checking out there, day or night. Let's continue a, a little bit more north to a park that I haven't really talked much about uh, in the essentially the history of, of Inside the Magic. It's Bush Gardens Williamsburg. I've never been there personally, but I do now have a reporter there named Emily who is part of their blogger ambassador program, which essentially means she's going to be covering absolutely everything Bush Gardens Williamsburg for the next uh, year or so for us, which is great. Uh, they just debuted a new show there called London Rocks. It's a combination of live singing and dancing and special lighting and animation effects and projections and uh, so if you want to see uh, more about that, you can watch a little video clip and uh, see some photos and uh, as well as her review of the show all over at InsideTheMagic.net. And coming up soon, there'll be some uh, some uh, info from their water park. They just uh, debuted a new uh, slide, I believe, and then uh, their, their food and wine event as well. So, uh, yeah, more to come from Busch Gardens Williamsburg as we uh, you know continue to expand uh, the, uh, the coverage of Inside the Magic. 
But back down here in Orlando, here's something that I will definitely be at quite a bit as I have been in the past. Coming up this weekend is Spooky Empire's Mayhem event. Uh, This time it's taking place at the Doubletree Hotel uh, across from Universal Orlando. It's May 30th through June 1st. I'm going to be there for all three days. I'm actually going to be uh, taking pictures for Spooky Empire as well as for Inside the Magic. So I'll be running around uh, the entirety of the the convention. And this year, uh, they've got quite a lot to look forward to. There's a new Day of the Dead opening celebration that's going to kick off the weekend with uh, a lot of makeup artists making uh, people over into you know Mexican Day of the Dead kind of look. Uh, Nyx from Face Off is going to be there as one of the makeup artists, so that's pretty cool. Sci-Fi's Face Off. Uh, there's going to be a costume contest with cash prizes, uh, and then there's going to be uh, qu- quite a few Disney celebrities there. Pat Carroll, the voice of Ursula, is returning. Last year, she was a smash success there. She did uh, the Ursula voice as the Haunted Mansion ghost host, if you remember that. Uh, Um, And quite a lot more. She told some great stories. I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. Uh, In addition, a whole lot of Once Upon a Time cast members will be there. The ABC show. Uh, Lana Perilla, Rebecca Mater, Sean McGuire, uh, Freya Tingley, I may have pronounced that wrong, and Jason uh, Burkhart are are going to be there in a panel and signing autographs and whatnot, as well as uh, two actors from the Pirates of the Caribbean film series will be there as well. Uh, Outside of the world of Disney, other notable names will be horror director John Carpenter, uh, Robert England, and uh, Heather Langenkamp from A Nightmare on Elm Street. That's Freddy Krueger himself. Uh, will be there. Uh, Jamie Kennedy from Scream and many, many more. There's also going to be a great uh, new version of the Muckle Bones Museum, which has a tribute to classic Halloween imagery, as well as uh, a charity event called the It's Alive Project uh, that they're using these busts of the Bride of Frankenstein, and a lot, I think a hundred different artists have uh, sort of offered their really unique uh, you know, sculptures and paint and, and artwork surrounding these busts. These busts um, should be quite a sight to see and all of that goes to charity as well uh, find out more information about this convention at spookyempire.com if you're going to be there I will see you there because I will be there the whole time except Saturday night Saturday night I'm going to Universal to go see Huey Lewis in the news for Mardi Gras because I've never seen Huey Lewis live and I'm really looking forward to that Now, speaking of conventions, let's jump coasts out to uh, Disneyland for some really fun news. Now, Disneyland has not said, uh, announced any plans. In fact, I don't think they have any plans to really celebrate the 45th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion. Uh, They're going to do some merchandise releases, maybe a small merchandise event, uh, but no sort of huge uh, anniversary event. So, the convention Scare LA in its uh, second year is uh, going to celebrate that anniversary in in a pretty big way on August 9th. Of this year, August 9th, is the anniversary, the 45th anniversary to the day of the Haunted Mansion. That's also the first day of the Scare LA convention in downtown LA. And uh, because of that, there's going to be a presentation by Jeff Baham uh, from DoomBuggies.com. He's calling the presentation When Hinges Creek, which is entirely appropriate. And joining him on the, in the presentation will be Disney legend, former Imagineer, and Doom Buggy designer Bob Gurr. Uh, I will be out there for that for sure, and you should be too because that sounds really exciting. And then the next day on August 10th, there's going to be a presentation from Hall- uh, uh, Universal Studios Hollywood for Halloween Horror Nights, and they're going to reveal something fun. So uh, definitely looking forward to all of that and the other fun, spooky stuff that will be going on there. ScareLA.com is where you can find out more information about that. Now let's move on to some movie news with more really, really big news from this week. Uh, Director J.J. Abrams, of course, is working on Star Wars Episode Seven. Production has already begun, and he recently sent out uh, this week a video update from the set of Star Wars in Abu Dhabi. Uh, It looks very deserty, of course, you know, Tatooine sort of look. Uh, And he was doing that because there's a contest, an opportunity to actually appear in the movie uh, and it's all going to charity uh, it's uh, you'll be if, if you manage to win this uh, contest there will be a winner uh, you will be flown to Pinewood Studios in London not to Abu Dhabi but to London when they're filming there you'll get a behind the scenes look at the set of episode 7 you'll see filming you'll meet the cast and you will be transformed into a Star Wars character to be in the movie and that includes flight and hotel uh, for, uh, flight for two people to go uh, to London etc so pretty awesome opportunity there's other prizes they're giving away as well now 
Now, it's not free to enter because this is all going to charity. So you go to uh, omaze.com, that's O-M-A-Z-E.com, and you can purchase entries, basically. Uh, you know, a certain dollar amount gives you one entry or two entries or, you know, 10,000 entries or however much you want to contribute. And uh, then you, you know, you might win a, a little collectible or you might win the whole thing. So uh, pretty exciting there. Now, what was also exciting about this video is not only was J.J. Abrams in it, but also walking up behind him was this creature of some sort carrying a whole lot of stuff on his back and it looked very Jim Henson-y uh, and uh, Jim Henson the company apparently had nothing to do with any of this but it gave you that feel it was a real uh, on set creature which I think you know was the point of including it there it was to show hey we're not doing just CG in this film we're doing real puppeteering and real on set creatures which is fantastic they keep saying they're trying to go back to the original look and feel of the uh, you know the original trilogy and this just sort of solidifies that it looks great uh you can watch that video over on our website and and definitely uh you know if you're one of the lucky or if you are the lucky person to be in the movie i want to hear all about it that's not the only big Star Wars news this week. Uh, it was uh, revealed that uh, the first of several spin-off standalone Star Wars movies is in the works. It has a release date, a director, and a writer, though we don't know what it's called or who's you know what, who's it going to be focusing on. But uh, it's in addition to the Star Wars trilogy, the new trilogy, uh, December 16th, 2016. That's less than a year after Episode 7 comes out. Uh, we're going to get a spin-off movie that's going to be directed Directed by uh, Gareth Edwards, who just recently directed Godzilla, that's uh, doing very well in theaters. Uh, it's going to be written by Gary Witta, whose screenwriting credits include uh, The Book of Eli, as well as Telltale Games' video game adaptation of The Walking Dead, which is very well written. Um, so pretty exciting uh, things to look forward to in the world of Star Wars. This movie could be focusing on a really well-known character, or it could be something new. We don't know, um, but uh, lots to look forward to. Now, there was a little bit of disappointing news, however, this week in the world of Marvel movies, as it was announced that Edgar Wright is no longer directing Ant-Man. He's been uh, developing this film for quite a long time, putting his sort of unique style on it. Uh, you know, he's uh, well known for uh, Scott Pilgrim, for example. Uh, very unique uh, directing style, and, and, and he was going to take that and, and make Ant-Man fit his mold. But apparently creative differences, as they say, uh, has now separated him from that project and Marvel is uh, seeking out somebody new so uh, well, well, I don't know we'll, we'll wait and see where that goes also in the world of movies, Walt Disney Animation Studios this week released the first full teaser trailer for Big Hero 6, which is their first uh, full-length animated film based on a Marvel property, a very obscure Marvel property, but uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty good. I you know, saw a little bit of snippets, uh, previews, early, early stuff uh, back at the D23 Expo, and now there's this teaser trailer, which you can see over at our website, along with the new poster. The movie comes out this year on November 7th, so I am I'm looking forward to it. Now, in the world of video games, there was a, a web browser-based game called Star Wars Attack Squadrons that was in beta testing for quite a while. I played it. I really enjoyed it. It was very simple, sort of outer space combat fun. Well, it's been canceled. Uh, didn't even have a chance. I guess, uh, you know, they went through a few beta tests and then decided, you know what, we're just not going to do this. So, unfortunately, if you were a fan of that, uh, well, move on, because it's not happening. And now the final bit of news this week is uh, another really, really big uh, bit of news. In fact, as this was going around this week, it, I think this was the biggest single news story that had been uh, ever on InsideTheMagic.net, just because it got passed around so much uh, and when it was announced. Uh, Disney on Ice is developing a new touring production based on Frozen. Uh, it will debut in September here in Orlando. It will have a cast of 39 performers and Frozen on Ice, which is, yeah, that's a little repetitive. Frozen on Ice uh, will follow the story, of course, of Anna and Elsa and Olaf and Kristoff and Sven and the trolls. All of those characters will be in there uh, skating around on ice. Uh, there will be a blizzard created by snow machines, a snowflake-shaped stage, video projections that make it look like uh, Arendelle and the North Mountain. It will include some 
songs like Let It Go, uh, Do You Want to Build a Snowman, even Fix Her Upper. And uh, in addition to all the Frozen characters, uh, Mickey and Minnie Mouse will be there at the, the uh, sort of acting as the hosts at the beginning and end of the show. Uh, also joined by uh, Disney princesses, characters from Toy Story, Finding Nemo, The Lion King. The show's being directed by Patty Vincent and also being developed with the help of John Lasseter. And uh, rehearsals will begin uh, in July. Tickets uh, officially go on sale June 3rd, uh, which is uh, next week at DisneyOnIce.com. However, there's been a lot of pre-sale codes being passed around uh, already, and the show is, is selling out like crazy. Uh, so if you don't have a ticket already to Frozen Disney on Ice, you're going to want to go to DisneyOnIce.com as soon as possible to buy your ticket. Um, there have been a few pre-sale codes that have been passed around, including uh, the word early, the word social. You can try those, see if you're able to find any tickets. It's uh, it's definitely going to be a big event. I bought tickets for the opening night here in Orlando, so I'm looking forward to seeing... I- I've never seen a Disney on Ice show before, um, and of course Frozen is huge, so I figured I-, I should probably go since this was, like I said, pretty much the biggest uh, story to ever come across. It's, you know, single link. Uh, single day commotion that surrounded this ever on our website which is which is crazy uh, you know frozen mania has no end so uh yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what they do to uh, to pull all this together there's a little bit of video of anna and elsa skating around along with a whole lot of concept art and costume designs over on our website as well um and even for some reason this was kind of random and out of nowhere i got a tweet from Michael Eisner. Uh, that, the, yes, the actual, real, yes, that Michael Eisner out of nowhere. He, he sent me a message on Twitter about Frozen on Ice, which was, yeah. So uh, it, it's that big of a story. So uh, yeah, definitely head over to the website if you want to see more about it. And then we'll have to wait till September to see uh, how it all comes together. And that'll do it for your news from around the world this week. And this week's tip comes in from Derek from Tennessee, who uh, offers a whole lot of advice for the Disney dining plan, which is something that I get asked about uh, quite a lot, and I don't really have much experience with. So here are some helpful tips from Derek, who writes, uh, what I have found helpful is that is the uh, Walt Disney World website itself. It allows you to virtually price your vacation without actually booking it. With just a few clicks of the mouse, you can see how much it would cost to add the dining plan. They're also, using Disney's website, you can find menus for the restaurants you're interested in, including prices. You might not know exactly what you'll be hungry for when you're in the parks, but you can get a pretty good idea of how much you'll spend and whether that is more or less than you'll spend on the dining plan. And a few things to remember, the dining plan probably includes more food than you'll actually eat. Uh, it includes a dessert for every meal. Uh, So while it might seem like a good bargain, you have to ask yourself, if I don't get the dining plan, will I really order or even need that much food? It's convenient for those who don't like to carry a lot of cash or uh, keep track of lots of debit card payments. So uh, many find the convenience is alone worth the added price. The dining plan does not, however, include tip. So if you eat at table service restaurants, uh, don't assume your meal is completely covered already. Derek, thanks very much for those tips. Uh, Definitely good. Good advice for the dining plan. Everybody else, email your tips into tips at insidethemagic.net. Joining me this week on Inside the Magic from themed entertainment design company PGAV Destinations are uh, Vice President Al Cross as well as architectural designer Josh Rodriguez to talk about sort of the ins and outs of what it takes to design uh, attractions and and scenic elements for theme parks. Uh, Al, Josh, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Hi, it's great to be here. So I understand that you've uh, your company has worked on you know big names uh, uh, theme parks like Universal Studios, SeaWorld, Busch Gardens, Six Flags. Um, uh, sort of taking give me the general perspective of what does that mean for a company like yours to uh, be hired by these companies to work on attractions? We are usually deeply involved uh, uh, right from the beginning. Um, Often at the strategy level, meaning you know, uh, often at the moment when the it is determined what product will be uh, added to a park, or or when it is determined that a park will be built, and then typically what happens is we uh, provide uh, creative 
and uh, branded, you know, bra branding uh, thinking, as well as all the design um, and uh, leadership, if you will, to 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 get the project uh, fully executed, all the way to the point of art direction in the field. So okay. all the consultants that work on a project in themed entertainment, like electrical engineers and uh, um, you know, animal life support systems consultants and, and people like that, they tend to uh, be led by us and, uh, and we help the client execute their vision beginning to end. Okay. So, uh, you know, we hear from uh, the parks, their designers a lot. When new rides, new attractions open, you hear from sort of their, their top, you know, creative directors. So it's those people that are working hand in hand with you to, um, you know, really make it a reality. Yeah, the, we, we usually work with, uh, with the uh, park creative uh, leaders to, to bring about their, uh, get an understanding of their brand uh, and basically the stories that they want to tell. And we work with uh, all of our consultants then to bring that to life. Great. You know, the, the, yeah, go ahead. these people differ in their methods and approaches. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, in the case of Universal, there is a, a, a really large and significant uh, in-house uh, creative leadership group called Universal Creative. Right. And they produce quite a bit. They produce they begin a project and produce things in different ways than, for example, um, the people who own and operate Puerto Ventura in Spain. So th these people vary wi widely and wildly in approach, temperament, and point of view, and, and it's our job to figure that out, learn it, and then understand what we can provide in the, in the varying contexts of each of these uh, kinds of companies. Yeah, well, it's it's always fascinating to watch the sort of the development cycle of an attraction. Usually, you know, the public hears about it so many years into it. Um, give me an example of a recent project that I, I would have heard of that maybe I've already experienced that, um, you know, how far back did you work on it and what, what did it take to really make it uh, go from concept to completion? Hmm. <laughs> one, one that you're allowed to talk about, of course. I know there's, you know, there's a lot of secrecy in the theme park world. There, there, there absolutely is, it's, and it's literally secrets. Um, what about Hotel Gold River? How long did that take? Hotel Gold River, for example, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a hotel that opened in Port Ventura, uh, out uh, in Spain, uh, about in 2009. Uh, that project was in development. Uh, it came about as uh, from a master plan that PJV had had done for for the park. Uh, we PJV did the the, the original Port Ventura park. And we were brought back in, in 2004 to uh, develop a new master plan. And, and so the, the, that hotel was one of the first projects to come out of that, that master plan. And so from, I mean, you could argue that from the moment that it was uh, added to the master plan in 2005, so the moment that it opened, you know, it was about a four to five year uh, development cycle. That's, I mean, that's, it's hard to think about for somebody like me, you know, kind of on the outside of this, uh, you know, what goes on during four to five years of time where, I mean, I'm sure you're juggling multiple projects during that time, but it's, it's got to be like a, a lot of back and forth, a lot of, you know, what if we do this? What if we do that? I'm sure there's money issues. You know, what, what are the biggest sort of challenges that makes a project take four to five years? <laughs> well, usually, uh, at least half of a project's development time is actual construction, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's sometimes it's less. So, um, right. So you so you have to uh, allow for that, and then uh, it can be difficult to set the right goal. You know, to to determine what the product actually ought to be. And so the really important, really big thinking that occurs at the beginning of a project when, you, when, when the group decides what they're going to do mm -hmm. and how they're going to pursue it uh, is probably the most difficult portion of the project because uh, it can be, especially if one begins without a really clearly, uh, without a clear point of view, you know, the, you get on a lot of, of, of dead uh, dead ends and blind alleys and, and take wrong turns. So you know, part of our strategy, part of our success is to actually draw out um, 
our clients, uh, you know, come to understand our clients' brand very deeply so that we are able to um, help them draw out the goal as early as possible because as soon as you set a clear goal, then everything just gets a lot easier. Right? Would you sure. agree with me, Josh, that the yeah. hard part is the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, it's, it's usually in setting, setting the, the tone, uh, establishing the, the uh, I mean, we'll get to this probably in a little bit, but establishing the story and determining what we're trying to do with what, they, what the end goal of the, of the project is, is, is usually the, the hardest part is, you know, what are the parameters? You know, we did, uh, we did the, um, one of my favorite projects is a th place called Discovery Cove, which is uh, in Orlando, and it's a place where people can swim with dolphins in the water. Yeah, yeah I've been there. I love it. And that project um, was always a great idea. I mean, we knew from the, obviously everybody knew from the beginning, okay, this is going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. But determining what we were going to build and what we were actually after in terms of demographic, length of stay, relationship to the bigger SeaWorld Park, how did the place actually work from a, a kind of a fundamental arithmetic point of view because of, you know, because these interactions with the animals are timed, right. and they're actually a matter of regulation. That took a couple of years. Wow. Once we knew what we were doing, you know, it was, honestly it was, the it was the smoothest construction project I've ever been involved with. But there was a great deal of logistical planning, and mm -hmm. it's because so much effort was placed on figuring out how to get it right before we really ever drew any of the lines that represented things that actually got built. <laughs> we drew a lot of lines, <laughs> but it wasn't for a while before we were drawing lines that were drawings that were going to actually get built. So once you've sort of uh, settled on that, you know, you've, uh, you've gone around and around and around and I'm sure countless meetings and you've decided on these details, um, the, the, what, what happens when your team actually begins work? I, I mean, I'm, uh, there are, you know, artists drawing things, writers writing things, you know, what are the, the tasks that are involved in the whole creation of one of these attractions or, or theme parks? In the case of, of uh, highly entertaining theme park attractions that include rides that involve, you know, um, sort of a beginning and middle end story, the first thing that happens is we have to settle on the story. Mm -hmm. You've got you to determine what you're actually saying. And so uh, what we call a story treatment uh, is created. You know, th you know this, is, this is the purpose uh, or this is the goal. This is what we want. These are the feelings we are trying to engender. This is how the ride uh, mechanism or vehicle or theming will support those feelings, and then you you can get to the point where you either storyboard it or script it, and uh, properly done. That's a great, um, pardon the term, blueprint uh, for the rest of the project. Mm -hmm. But and so that's how we start. And and honest and and as as part of that start too, you know, we might we might find out that in in the the development, the initial development. Maybe the best the we best way to tell whatever story we're trying to tell isn't you know it might not be a, a coaster necessarily it might be a different type of ride system so that also falls into into that that part of the the development and and throughout all that all that you know we have the uh, all of our folks uh, on on the team basically starting off with uh, the bones that will eventually build to the documents that you know a contractor is going to use eventually to uh, to build the project. Once, mm -hmm. once, once that concept has been nailed down, then we move into into the production of, of documentation that can be used to actually make it real. And and throughout all that, you know, there's still there's always always meetings to make sure that that the initial concept is, is held to, and and it's it's that the project remains faithful to that uh, throughout the whole way. Um, and then once the once the documentation is is set, then a uh, contractor comes on board, and or multiple contractors, depending on the size of the project, and uh, essentially uh, build it. And throughout that part of the process, our team uh, and uh, works with the owner to make sure that the initial vision and the initial the initial concept that we started out with is is held to uh, through through the construction. So all the details reflect uh, the the emotion and the 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 story that we were that we set out to tell initially.
Well, you know, you've mentioned the story a few times now, and I, of course that's a huge part of every theme park uh, attraction out there. You know, whether you're looking at Disney, who, you know, started all of the theme park everything with Disneyland so many decades ago, basing these, you know, dark rides and everything on these story-based experience. And now today, you know, the stories have just gotten bigger and bigger and more immersive. Um, I understand that you've actually got a book that you're you're working on publishing uh, called Storytelling, It Can Change Your Mind, in which you've really... Uh, kind of dive deep into what what does it take to craft a great story? You're right. We do. <laughs> well, tell tell me what does it take? I mean, what what have you learned about storytelling? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Um, to, to me, the most compelling uh, new information, if you will, that we uncovered in 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 the process of of doing this is what actually happens as a story is being rendered, sort of the interaction between two entities. And I am, to me, this, we have sort of entered the, as you mentioned, we've, we've sort of entered the, the era where the world has come to accept this constant conversation about how important stories are to mm-hmm. all of us. I, I call this the era of the story. And and it, people are aware of it, you know, and, and people you read about it in the newspaper, you know, and you and you encounter consultancies who are built around using storytelling as problem solving and all that. So the point is, the world has kind of opened its mind uh, to this notion that stories are, are perhaps more important than we used to think they are. And what I have enjoyed about preparing to, to have the storytelling that can change your mind uh, come out is this idea that how engaged our minds actually are. And, and we've, we've all grown up uh, during the era of brain research, and what's cool is we have come to realize that when a story is being told, when someone is telling someone else a story, that the, that the receiver, the listener, the audience, uh, the mind is actually larger, more parts of the brain actually become excited during storytelling than during other events in their lives. And so, in other words, it must mean something. You know, everything is lighting up inside a person's brain. Large sections of their brain are lighting up during the process of storytelling. And then, in addition to that, it would appear from the research that we've encountered at Washington University and other places that often parts of the brain in the storyteller's mind, the, the same parts are actually syncing with the parts of the brain that are excited during in the audience's mind when they're listening. And I find this, I'm not sure quite all where this is going, but I'm pretty sure it's going someplace cool <laughs> in that we're, we're on to something here that is, is really powerful in terms of a lot of our work what we can talk to audiences about, and how they're going to receive what we say. Well, it's certainly, I mean, that would say a lot about the themed entertainment industry in that, you know, you've got, sure, you've got your thrill rides, and, you know, you get on a roller coaster, you have fun, it's exhilarating, it's, you know, adrenaline rush and all of that, but uh, what it sounds like you're saying is that the attractions that tell you a story in addition to all of that are are almost more beneficial for a person because you're really engaging them on multiple levels. Yeah, and it, it's and that that's what the, the I think that's where where the 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 increase in in and focus in, in stories definitely uh, been going is that uh, we we've realized it's not just about building tallest uh, we've all realized it's not just about building the tallest and fastest but mm-hmm. how do you make it memorable and and there's there's the whole you know this is a, we've, everybody talks about uh, the digital age and how uh, you know we're all focusing too much on our on our smart devices and. I, I think there's a big focus on uh, creating memories, and and that's that's a big part of, of storytelling, obviously, because then when you get home, you you make a big point to tell your friends about all the cool stuff that that you saw when you went to went to Orlando, or or if you you know you went hiking in Yosemite and and all the amazing uh, vistas that you saw there. Um, it's 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 a it's a way it's become a way to. Uh, Create essentially bookmarks in in, in people's lives. <laughs> That's a cool word. Uh, it's just, it's just a way to 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 mark 
you know, if people are, are uh, uh, vacations are more deliberate and, and thought through more uh, nowadays too. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is a way for people to, to essentially pers personalize their, their, uh, their experiences at, at, at these locations. So how does that, you know, there's, you could argue there's, there are varying levels of story uh, in, uh, you know, depending on which park you're in and what type of park you're in mm -hmm. and the difference between a hardware park and a, a highly themed park and a, a park that's oriented more towards small children and a park that's more, more oriented towards family entertainment. But the point is, it, is that it, it now seems like there should never not be story elements, you know, if, if one truly wants to create repeat visitation, meaningful engagement, and real memories. And so, you know, first, it sort of proves you've got to have it. Right. And then second, it sort of proves that the more you do with it, the more you're going to succeed with it. And, you know, that, that, that there is no, there's no reason to stop doing it. There's no limit, no, no upside limit to how much you can do with the power of story. So it's, it's just this, this new turn in the industry that's, that's nothing but positive. So, you know, you, you've talked to neuroscientists, historians, you know, storytellers. What, what, what is the one thing that you've learned from your research in, in working on this book that you can now uh, take with you and apply to your projects moving forward in your company that you're really, you know, sort of excited, like, oh, we have to do that from now on? <laughs> Hmm. I, I, to me, it's, it's probably the, the fact that we have to be mindful. I mean, not that, not, not that we weren't, but we, we have to always be mindful about how the story is presented and, and the fact that it's, it's, it generates a physical reaction in your brain mm -hmm. is, all right, then let's figure out multiple ways to, to have that story come out, whether it's with interactives, whether it's with a ride, uh, you know, you're... you're your, uh, touch pools for for animals. Um, it's it's how how do you bring bring all those different stimulus into your attraction so that it, it essentially enhances the the overall story of the the product. You know, Ricky, I I I, I think I understand your question, but I I'm, I think I want to take a personal take on it too. What sure. it means to me is not that it has caused me to imagine. Can I find a new way, or can I find it? Not that you would suggest this, but that can I find a new gimmick, or can I can I find a new twist? To me, what it means is, I am I have to take it as a responsibility. You know, I have to get it right. I I we all we've always thought that story was powerful. You know, we always we always have to told ourselves that, but what we're learning, and as you say, we've sort of proven this by this neuroscience that we've encountered is that we were right, and, and it, it makes you take a step back and, and say to yourself, we really have a responsibility to the audience to deliver because we're, we're messing with our minds. And <laughs> right, yeah. It, as silly as it sounds, it's not silly at all. We are. We're trying to get in there. Yeah. You know, we're, try, we're trying to, to, to move electrons around inside people's brains, and it comes with responsibility. You've got to get it right. You've got you to try as hard as you can do to get it as good as you can make it. Well, I, I think that's good news for all theme park fans or, you know, fans of all these attractions that there's going to be more elaborate experiences to look forward to uh, in the future. And for those who want to learn more about what you've you've researched here, how can people get a hold of this book? We have it up on our on our website, uh, pjvdestinations.com. OK, and we can. I'll share it. We'll uh, share a link with you uh, that you can post on your on your site. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's it's all fascinating. We're not selling the book. We are distributing the book. Okay. So uh, it, 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 it's a serious piece of, you know, it's a it's a serious endeavor. But we mm -hmm. want people to think it. We, we want to make it available to people who who are interested. Yeah. No, that's great. I think I think a lot of people would be. You know, you you go to a theme park and you can experience it, and you you know you had fun, or you know you took something away with it, but maybe you don't know why. You know, and, and to hear about the science behind it is is quite fascinating. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the people who have already uh, read it, we're getting some pretty cool reaction to it, including some industry insiders who are sort of like, "Wow, this is this is interesting. This is an interesting point of view to take." And and uh, I enjoyed reading it. So, so we're we're proud of it, and we hope it gets out there. 
Fantastic. Well, I'm happy to help spread the word here. And of course, that website again is uh, pgavdestinations.com. And uh, you can flip through uh, uh, different uh, projects that you've worked on in the past and see some of your work. And uh, uh, Al, Josh, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to chat today. Thank you, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Ricky, this is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Inside the Magic Listener Feedback. Hopefully you enjoyed that conversation uh, with uh, PJV Destinations. A little bit, uh, sort of a step back behind the curtain, behind the themed entertainment industry, amidst all of the news that's always going on between Seven Doors, Mind Train, and Diagon Alley, and everything else that's you know just happened and is coming up. Uh, it is good sometimes to take that step back and uh, and really hear about what uh, it, how it all comes together. So uh, there's that. Now let's move on to a little bit of listener feedback to round out this week's show, starting with. With an email from Susan from California who was just here for Star Wars weekends and actually experienced quite a lot from the event that I did not um, some of the special packages and, and whatnot so uh, I'm going to read you her report from Star Wars weekends to give you another perspective on the event beyond what I talked about on last week's show uh, so Susan writes uh, just a few uh, observations here to begin with Susan says uh, I noticed they are finally using the large video screen on the main stage to show what is happening uh, so the people aren't all cramming up in the front, uh, who aren't cramming in the front, can still see something. Uh, I wonder why they never used it this way for Hoopla. Uh, good question there. Anyway, uh, uh, continuing on, uh, I did try to uh, some of the new experiences this year, the character dining in Hollywood and Vine, the Feel the Force Preferred viewing and slash dessert package and Akbar Snack Bar located in uh, Darth's Mall shopping area. The character dining was pricey, but on par for other character experiences. If you don't want to stand in line to get photos and autographs of the characters and uh, you need to fill up on Star Wars themed fair like Darth Vader cupcakes, it is worthwhile. The Feel the Force package included preferred viewing area for the motorcade and the evening show with sweets and refreshments included. Much like the fast passes for the shows, for both events you still needed to arrive early to get a really good spot. Since I'm only 4 foot 7 uh, inches tall, it's almost a waste of money since I still get stuck behind people if uh, you don't get there ultra early. For the motorcade, we were near the stage, but they dropped the barrier once the last car went by, so we had to push ahead with the rest of the crowd following the uh, the end banner. For the fireworks, it had a similar issue. You had a decent spot to see the stage, but if someone in the crowd between the barrier and the stage moved in front of you, you had to move around to see. Because the reserved area was fairly large, you could move around easily, which was the biggest advantage of getting this package. I was able to watch the stage show and then move to the back to watch the fireworks. I also had a secure place to set down my stuff while I ran around taking pictures. The package also included uh, the event photos of all the celebrity guests and a photo pass with special downloadable images. Akbar's Snack Bar had its own 15 to 30 minute line of all the special items, uh, Vader Popcorn Bucket, Stormtrooper Stein, were available in other locations in the park. Even the special light side and dark side drinks were being served elsewhere. The only thing I saw unique was the glowing Death Star ice cube floating in the dark side drink, which I will actually just add a footnote there that I also saw that floating uh, Death Star ice cube sort of plastic thing somewhere else in the park as well, so that wasn't even uh, actually unique to there. Uh, continuing on with her email... I noticed uh, the offered. Uh, they also offered a VIP package for four hundred dollars plus. I guess that's good for someone who wants to see as much as possible in a day. If you can be there for two to three days, you can see all the shows, meet most of the characters, and spend that four hundred dollars instead in Darth's Mall. Personally, I like hanging out with the crowd and waiting in lines as long as they're not too long. Uh, I come in costume, so it's great interacting with other fans, sharing stories, and knowing that you're not the only person with six lightsabers in their closet. Uh, Susan, I can assure you, you are not, because I definitely have many many lightsabers from all across the years, dating back to, you know, forever, 20 years ago lightsabers to today's lightsabers, and build your own lightsabers, and super duper special light up ones, and yeah, I've got plenty of those, so you're not the only one, so uh, thanks for uh, all the additional info from Star Wars Weekends. And uh, actually, I'm just going to share one more thing this week since the show's running a little bit long, and that is a voice message from Maggie. Hi, Ricky. It's me, Maggie Cameron. Um, I haven't talked to your um, senior in a very, very long time. I've actually been very busy with my senior year of high school. I'm actually about to graduate in about two weeks. But I actually have a big question for you because um, for my graduation present, I'm actually going to Disneyland, California for the first time, which I'm super excited about. 
But my main concern and the only concern I probably have about the trip is that I have very, very bad food allergies to the point where I have to carry an EpiPen on me at all times. And it makes eating out very, very difficult. At least at Walt Disney World, I have an easy time talking to chefs and getting ingredients for food to make sure I can eat some stuff and, you know, make, make sure what I can't eat and can eat. And I really can't find anything for Disneyland. So is there any way I can contact them or talk to somebody to see if I can talk to a chef about food allergies? I know you probably may not have the answer for this, but maybe some of your listeners will have something to say. So I would love to hear what they would have to say. Ricky, you're doing an awesome job. Thank you for keeping everybody updated with all the stuff that you do for all the events, Disney or non-Disney. And just thank you for everything. Have a great day. Thanks. Great to hear from you. You know, I'm sure a lot of you remember uh, Maggie's contributions to this show uh, uh, several months ago. Sounds like, uh, as we all tend to do, she got very busy and, and certainly congrats about uh, graduating and, and more importantly, congrats about going out to Disneyland for the first time. Uh, you, you were certainly in luck when traveling to Disney when it comes to allergies because it's it's pretty much the same at Disneyland as it is out here at Walt Disney World with regards to them being uh, uh, very proactive about making sure that uh, there are not going to be any issues for you. There's a phone number that you can call uh, to discuss your uh, dietary needs and requests with them, and that is 714-781-DINE, which is 3463. Uh, so you can uh, certainly talk to them there, and then uh, you can, you know, if you don't plan uh, or aren't able to set up any specific plans via that phone number in advance, you can still uh, of course ask for you know whatever chefs or whatever's necessary when you get there, but I know uh, they are able to sort of pre-arrange uh, certain foods, uh, you know, even even put them aside in special uh, uh, plastic bags, and you know, I know I've seen them do that for uh, kosher meals. Um, uh, with with I don't even remember when that was, but I know I've seen it. Uh, so they are they are quite accommodating. Is, is certainly the point here, just as much at Disneyland as out here at Walt Disney World. Certainly, you won't be able to eat everything naturally because, and I'm sure you're used to that. But um, there are uh, there's a whole page on the Disneyland website about dietary requests and. Uh, uh, certain uh, restaurants that are are good for uh, being able to have uh, you know alternative foods, etc. But they do uh, ask that uh, for those who do require EpiPens that you can uh, alert people of that as much as possible um, just in case uh, anything were to happen. And, of course, bring that with you, which you know already. So, uh, yeah, the, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I, I would give that phone number a call, discuss it with them, and you should be able to plan accordingly and have fun. Sounds like it's going to be a great trip. And, uh, and that'll do it for listener feedback this week. at the end of show 477 you know during the 24 hour day I went on the carousel of progress first time I've done that in a while every time I do that I feel like uh, my podcast is ending repeatedly between every scene because this music comes on and, and anyway uh, so uh, uh, next week I don't know exactly what's going to happen with the show because I will be at Spooky Empire's Mayhem the entire weekend uh, all the days including Sunday uh, so I may not record the show until afterward until Monday so don't uh, don't freak out if you, there's no podcast on Sunday, uh, it will be uh, coming. Certainly some fun Disney uh, things going on at that convention that I'll probably share on uh, next week's show once all said and done there. And of course you can visit uh, our website uh, and YouTube channel to see some highlights from it as well. And certainly lots and lots of photos. I always take a, a bazillion photos there every year of all the great costumes and merchandise and celebrities and all that sort of thing. Always really, really fun. And there's a lot to look forward to uh, coming up as well. Of course, outside of that, uh, Diagon Alley could soft open at any moment. I mean, they're still putting a lot of finishing touches on it so it's not going to be tomorrow um, but as soon as that dragon has its wings and is breathing fire uh, that's you know one of those finishing touches that they are working on uh, amongst others um, I saw the Hogwarts Express going around on its on the track today uh, blown its whistle and steam coming out and so they're you know actively making it all come together uh, which I'm really looking forward to getting in there sometime in the uh, in the semi near future and it certainly you know if, if for some reason there is no soft opening uh, uh, middle of June is when I'm going to be in there for the uh, the big press preview event, as they're calling it, and then I'm sure they're going to uh, talk about a grand opening at some point.
point uh, during all of that as well. So lots to look forward to there. It is really the big story in the world of theme parks. So much more to come there. I do want to thank Magical Travel for uh, sponsoring this week's show. You can find out more about their services by visiting MagicalTravel.com. And of course, visit InsideTheMagic.net between uh, each show here to find all of our podcast videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. Uh, definitely follow us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube for uh, all that extra fun throughout the week. So thanks to all of you for listening each and every week. And have a magical week. Bye. At the end of every day, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Just a dream away. 